Everybody, welcome back. Excited to be here for another Fireside Chat. Uh, this is going to be something that's uh, a little bit different. Um, we have uh, somebody that I've been following for a little while. I, I read her blog, all the stuff that she posts on, on social media. Um, and I've been a big fan of hers for, for maybe a couple of years now um, and everything she's doing. We're going to get into who she is, what she does, what she's getting into now. But uh, there was something special about a post that she sent into the world I think maybe a week ago. Um, we'll get into the details here in just a sec, but uh, it really resonated with me and I thought it would resonate with you as well. So we invited her to be on the show. Cody Sanchez, investor, entrepreneur, advocate, speaker, and my favorite contrarian. Cody, welcome. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, so for the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I want to uh, kind of paint the picture of who you are for our audience first and then kind of get into that post and why I enjoyed it so much. Um, your background again, uh, angel investor. You're head of an international investment uh, business advisor to startups, venture capitalist, private equity investor, speaker, entrepreneur, and journalist. And now recently, cannabis, uh, a cannabis cannabis private equity fund partner at Entourage Effect Capital. Uh, first of all, leave some for the rest of us. You're doing so much, which is great. How are you able to manage all that? Um, you know, I, I think the there's actually a downside to doing that many things, which is you have to make sure that you do a few things exceptionally well. And so, you know, 80% of my time is really focused on Entourage Effect Capital, which is our cannabis investment fund. Um, and But what I've realized is there start to be these concentric circles that overlap when you create a business. And so, you know, around EEC, we created a newsletter you know, that's tailored to cannabis. And then we had people that wanted to talk about investing in general and contrarian thinking. So I created a contrarian thinking newsletter. And then, you know, we needed to spread the word about investing in cannabis. So I started speaking at a bunch of conferences, um, you know, and then we invest in these individual companies and they need help, you know, getting out there, growing, doing the grind that is entrepreneurship. And so we all started offering tools for them. And so I think, you know, how it starts is you're, you're, you're keep the main thing, the main thing, and then you build these circles that overlap and eventually you have an ecosystem that's sort of all synergistic and works hand in hand. And so far so good. I mean, you're able to keep everything in track and, and put all of your effort, all of your time and resources into um, everything you're involved in, it looks like. Yeah. I mean, I think there's certainly areas we want to be better right now. I'm experimenting a lot with um, doing more content because, you know, we can't travel and be on planes like you and I were talking about like crazy. And so we just started a video series that we do once a week that goes live on LinkedIn. So we'll see how that does. Um, but, you know, the baby's just being born. So we got to <laughs> shape it a little bit. And right. then, um, you know, and, and I think some of the stuff that does slip through the track cracks when you have this many things going on are the the big, long strategic uh, projects. So I do try to take, you know, I'm really prescriptive with my week. If you saw my calendar, you'd think I was nuts. Um, but I'm very specific about the times that I do certain items and um, shutting up all the notifications and uh, not letting anybody come into my office when I'm doing the deeper work. And I think that's what keeps me sane and able to move the ball forward. What's your background? What did you do in school and right after? I mean, because I know you've been in finance, you've done a couple different things. Yeah. So um, for undergraduate, I was business and journalism. So I actually started off my career being a human trafficking and drug trafficking reporter along the U.S.-Mexico border. So, um, you know, kind of come full circle to now working in an industry that's trying to sort of eradicate the, the drug trafficking issue, um, but from a capitalistic bent, which I really like. Um, so I did that. And then I, um, I got a little jaded. I realized that it wasn't enough for me to spread awareness. I wanted to make some change. And journalism is great for spreading awareness. But the real thing that makes change is um, money. You know, he who holds the purse strings makes the rules. And so um, I wanted to figure out what does it mean to invest, to create wealth, um, and to understand the universal language, which is currency. And so that's when I started climbing through Vanguard and Goldman Sachs and State Street and First Trust and building a couple of businesses along the way until we finally launched our own fund. Um, but, you know, it was all surrounding this idea of how do we create wealth in non-traditional ways? How do we think outside of the box and how do we sort of flip the script? And so my whole career was that. And, and now I feel like it's coming to much more fruition than it did early on. Early on, I was definitely in learning mode. And now I think I'm in a little bit more of creation mode. So much to unpack there. So let's start with this. Um, 
all those companies that you mentioned, anybody, most people would be like, I, I've made it, right? I'm, I'm working with the big boys. Uh, this is enough. I'm going to have a nice little career. I'm going to retire. It's going to be fantastic. Somehow that wasn't uh, enough for you. Yes, yeah, well, a sickness. <laughs> yeah, well, more. you know, I think um, I just have that type of personality that wants to keep growing and learning. And the moment that, you know, something stagnates um, or, you know, there's become some sort of stagnation, I, um, I get bored and I need to go to the next thing. So I learned that about myself pretty early and would hire great COOs in my businesses um, in order for them to do a lot of the execution once I had done some of the you know, exploration and creation of, of the growth of a business. And so um, I think that's what it was. I just wanted to keep learning and growing and I wasn't very comfortable with doing the same thing every single day, day after day. The only thing that I love doing that much is um, investing and I love growth hacking businesses and writing. And if I could do those three things in some capacity, then I'm, I'm still engaged. You're speaking our language. I mean, a lot of the people that listen to our show and are part of our community, I mean, they, they feel the same way. They, they need to keep moving. They need to keep learning. And, and sometimes it means moving on from great jobs or great opportunities or great organizations to kind of do your own thing. And it sounds like obviously you have experience in, in doing that. So congratulations. It takes, you know, it's tough, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think sometimes it'd be amazing to, to be able to be so comfortable with being comfortable. Um, you know, hats off to people that, you know, are really content in their lives. And I just, I don't have that button. Um, so, you know, these days that's seen as a good thing, but sometimes it is good to stop and smell the roses. So I get that as well. But, you know, I do think that um, I've always sort of lived by the quote of Emma Bombeck, which is that, you know, when I stand before God at the end of my days, I want to be able to tell him that I have not one drop left within me. You know, I want to show up empty. And I love that idea. And I love the idea of, you know, I'm really driven by the singular idea that I think investing in businesses and building businesses is one of the greatest things we can do for ourselves economically, for building wealth, not just for ourselves, but for others, for building our community. And, um, and so I'm sort of on a mission to do that. You, um, I know you could be doing so many other things right now. You're big on cannabis right now. Why this? Why now? Yeah, I mean, cannabis is fascinating. So I'm always looking for, like I talked about, where you can flip the script. So where does everybody have some sort of consensus opinion that means that they're unwilling to take a risk or they don't see a risk that I see um, that can have outsized rewards? And so cannabis is fascinating because it is the fastest growing industry in the U.S., it is the number one fastest growing job creation industry in the US. There are more cannabis employees than there are employees employed by the entire coal industry. Um, the industry, yeah, it's this sleeping giant. And what I found in it, and there's like three trends that people weren't realizing. One is the institutional capital. So the pensions, sovereign wealth funds, um, you know, big private equity funds, they usually are the ones that reap all the benefits from new industries. Well, in this case, they can't invest in cannabis because it's still federally illegal and they have something called the vice clause. So there was this hole of capital that was so giant, you could move a freight train through it. And until legalization happens, those who invest in this space, we get an outsized return on our dollars because the other people can't come in and play. Um, and so that's huge. Uh, and then you think about the two other trends that are real right now, which is one, it's a recession resistant industry. I was worried that we were coming into a recession. I didn't see COVID, but I thought it might be something. And so cannabis like tobacco, alcohol, healthcare, consumer staples, people buy despite recessionary periods. You got some downside protection. And then the third aspect that I thought was fascinating is there is a $50 billion, uh, we call it uh, black market, illicit market in cannabis. And right now there's a $20 billion legal market. So our portfolio companies essentially just need to start moving the dark market over to the light market. And we start to see unfair returns. And that's if they do nothing else, like bring on new consumers, which is happening every day. So cannabis is fascinating right now. And I think, you know, no better time to invest than today when you can get valuations at where you can get them at in the fastest growing industry in the space with some downside protection. 
Yeah, you call it uh, generational wealth. Um, what, what's creation. The, creation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't, like this, I mean, for a while, right? Uh, when it comes to, to this type of opportunity. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Like, and let me say up front, it's not a gold rush anymore. We have this period where a lot of speculative, you know, they call it retail money comes in and they just, they think they're going to get in before the next dumb guy gets in at a better price. And that's how you get asset bubbles, right? But in this, in today, we already had this reset in valuation of cannabis companies, very similar to the 99 tech bubble. And so you don't have this speculative, speculative money anymore. And so, so you get a chance to be much more strategic with your dollars. So I don't think you should go and buy a bunch of cannabis stocks. In fact, I think stocks in general are, are still overpriced in this market and are going to fall. Um, just my humble opinion. Um, but I do think if you can get in on the private side, and invest in individual companies where you can have a longer runway because our time horizons more than just day trading like stocks are, you can really, you can have some outsized returns if you do it right and um, and do it with people who have experience. So that's that's been our bet at least. So you, you're positioned perfectly with what you're doing and the partners that you have in place. Uh, what, what role is this pandemic playing with it? Does it matter? Uh, what are you seeing as far as numbers and opportunity moving forward? Yeah. So, um, you know, I was a little nervous when the pandemic hit that cannabis would not be listed as an essential service. Mm. I did not see it coming that in basically every state and county, they had deemed cannabis an essential service. And so we went from illegal to essential in 90 days. It's astounding. I've never right. seen anything like it. And so while all these other companies in the world, which you and I know all too well are struggling with revenue, cannabis revenue is up 78% year over year. And so that's not even including the amount of new consumers that are have never touched cannabis before, at least in the, in the legal market, and are for the first time coming on board. We're talking 200 plus percent increase in new consumers. And so the numbers are pretty interesting. Sales are at all time high. There's plenty of warts and problems on the industry, which you want because that's where you can make opportunity, um, such as the tax codes extremely high. A lot of cannabis companies went out for growth at all costs. Uh, that never turns out well for anybody. And so the real opportunity in my mind right now is investing in early stage startups in cannabis that have a lot of runway and don't have bloated balance sheets and even more so distressed companies that need capital right now that have real businesses and revenue and we can come in and buy them at all time low valuations and allow the companies to continue to grow and employees stay on board and we can make returns the likes of which you know you probably haven't seen since 2008 i love it this this is i love it in, in a lot of different things right like you mentioned, wealth creates jobs. It's uh, it's stable, all, all that good stuff. But then, with this particular, you know, the can uh, the cannabis uh, side of it, what's it going to do on the other side for the black market and everything that it kind of encompasses, you know, with crime and you know everything yeah. else it does? I mean, are, are we going to see a change in some of the things that we're seeing in you know the inner cities or just uh, actually all over the place, not just in inner cities anymore? What's that going to look yeah. like? That's a good question. Um, well, so if I go to the data as opposed to my opinion, you know, I love Howard Marks says, um, you know, in, in any type of, um, you know, new industry or whenever there's uncertainty, we only have three things. We have facts, we have inferences, and we have opinions. And so the facts are that in markets where cannabis is legalized, we see a large scale over time decrease, we can't tell if this is causation or correlation, but a decrease in opioid um, drug related oh, deaths. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. We see a decrease actually in um, drunk driving, drug driving deaths. And this one's a little bit unclear. Some states are different, um, but we have seen a trend that seems to show a decrease in criminalization. And so, um, you know, I, I think the trends all point really positive. I saw this crazy article today that I also don't know if it's true, but I thought it was like too good not to share, which is like, then then like stuff like this comes out, which is like scientists believe cannabis could help prevent and treat coronavirus. Now, this is the New York Post. So like, this is probably please, just, let it happen, let it happen. Yeah, it's probably just clickbait. But the great part is there's so much stigma surrounding cannabis that, um, 
it's been such a negative story for so long that when the data comes out, we keep getting surprises on the upside because we have had such a negative perspective on cannabis for the past 100, 200 years. Yeah, we're, we're asking um, these investors that usually are a little bit older at this point um, to kind of take a chance on this when their whole lives it's been stay away, stay away, stay away. And then it looks like right. a new generation that hopefully is going to take advantage of this and set themselves up properly with, with, with this opportunity. I think that's exactly right. You know, it's um, the nice part about this industry growth is when it's done right, right? When, when you aren't a speculator and you actually know how to operate companies in the space, um, what we're seeing is that it's largely people like you and me. It's maybe some family offices, but it's not very many hugely, you know, um, Cash, cash rich or sophisticated institutions. And so the movement um, is one of the first ones where, you know, people like you and I get to take down deals that if we were in any other industry, KKR or Blackstone or Carlisle would be the first one on the table and, and we would, you know, get the scraps. Sure. And increasingly companies aren't going public, they're staying private. And so private deals are really only open traditionally for big, huge investors with a lot of money. These days, these private companies and cannabis will take smaller checks because they're so capital starved. And so there's kind of an opportunity for a little bit more democratization of entry than not. It makes my job miserable. Don't don't get me wrong. It means we're raising not, you know, what I use I my last group is billions and billions of dollars. This fund is about $160 million. So we have to raise much smaller amounts. Um, but it's an opportunity for all of us to get in that we won't post legalization, in my opinion. Yeah. So everything I've read, everything I hear from you, um, it, it seems like the sky's the limit. What are some of the drawbacks or challenges that you see coming up? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, this industry needs to be treated with some respect if you're going to invest in it. And what I mean by that is um, it's a highly complex industry. It is highly regulated. It may be the most regulated industry out there. Um, there are a lot of bad operators in the space. You have to do an incredible amount of due diligence on deals before you actually move through with them. Um, and so, you know, in other industries that are further along, they're just more mature. They're more adult-like. You can think about the cannabis space as more teen-like. You know, it's it's in the early stages. And so there are still some pimples on the space. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know how to find those and manage those and work through it, then you can do really well. But if you're a brand new investor and you try to just give money to an individual cannabis deal, I don't think that's a smart move. In my opinion, you got to start with a fund. Definitely doesn't have to be mine, but you need to start with some people who know where the bodies are buried in the industry. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot of investors and private equity funds come to us and say, we want to do co-investing deals with you. They know how to do the model and the framework, but they don't know the industry. And that industry part is super important. I, I love it. It's uh, it's going to be an interesting, um, I, I don't know, story, right? I mean, what is this going to look like in five, 10 years? I, I'm excited about it. It's it's uh, it's going to be different for sure. And and uh, obviously there's going to be some, maybe some roadblocks and some hiccups, but uh, overall it looks, looks fantastic. And so congrats uh, to you and your partners and everybody else that's, uh, it's making it happen. Um, it's very exciting, actually. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't imagine this is not legal in 10 years. I mean, I think there's a huge option that given how bad this recession is, I think within the next five years, certainly. And I think there's a surprise possibility that this legalizes in the next 48 months, 24 yeah. to 48 months. Yeah. Yeah, because um, we have such an economic crisis to deal with and, and cannabis is a huge tax generator. So, so we'll see, but I, I had a different, I thought we had three to seven years left, maybe getting closer to 10 pre COVID. Um, and now with everything that happens, I think, you know, we legalize with inside three years. That'd be fantastic. We'll see. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm okay. Sure. It's true. I'm okay. Having a few more years of us being able to operate. So I'm fine with being wrong there. Yeah. Um, but I think for consumers and users, it's it's definitely a good thing to legalize sooner rather than later. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye on it, and obviously, we're going to follow you and everything you're doing. But uh, l let's get to this post that uh, that I really loved. Sure. Uh, our audience, entrepreneurs, um, people that are working nine to five, they want to be entrepreneurs or have side hustles. Uh, a lot of podcasters yeah. as well in our audience. Um, uh, again, scrolling through Instagram, I've been following you for a little while. There was a post, normal post 
normal picture. Actually, I don't even remember what the picture was, but a normal picture, I'm assuming of you or, or, you know, something. Um, and then I, I happened to read the post, which is a little bit longer than, than usual. And it caught my eye because of the things that you said. Um, so let me read this here and just, uh, and then we can talk about some the three points that, that uh, you talked about. P- uh, post started something like this. The world is starting to reopen, but very, very slowly here in California. It won't be fast enough. I have a plea, right? So you're talking to the people that are, that are following you. Um, employees, it's not just business owners who need to step up. We all do. Um, and then you talked about if the business you work for goes under, the government can't support you forever. Right. That that's what hooked me. Obviously, we need to kind of create our own destiny, whether we're employees or business owners. Um, but down down at the bottom. You started talking, you started kind of giving advice about what to do now if you're stuck in this. And I got to tell you, I've read a bunch of books, have listened to a lot of smart people give great presentations. And this rivals and how simple it is. This rivals a lot of those books and a lot of those presentations that I've heard over the last 10, 15 years in how simple it was. And the call to action was again, simple, but not everybody does it. Um, and I, I doubt that there are going to be a lot of people that disagree with this, but there are certainly going to be a lot of people that don't heed this advice. And so anyway, yeah. one of the things that you talked about, if you're an employee, even if you're laid off, call on your old company or a new one uh, that you want to work for, ask them where, let's see, I have a hard time reading my own writing. Ask them where you can help <laughs> revenue. Even better, share your ideas with them now for free. Ask if you, ask if you, let's see. If it does succeed, um, if they'll take you back after the the, vi- the pandemic uh, or share in the uh, equity. Let's talk about this, yep. right? How many people are doing yep. this? Uh, again, it's simple to understand for a lot of us are still sitting at home kind of licking our wounds. Yeah, you know, I think the, there's two things at play. One, um, during times of uncertainty, we tend to have one of two actions. It's the fight or flight, right? And the fight or flight in this instance is actually, it's paralysis or it's poised for action. And so most people in this instance, they're paralyzed. They're sitting, they're waiting, they're watching. I can't tell you how many times I hear that from investors and from operators. And um, you know, I believe that action is pretty much always better than inaction. Um, and so, you know, the the thing that I think what, for employees is so nuts is the world is your oyster. Everyone is working remote these days, and everybody is focused on one thing, which is driving bottom line revenue. And every single one of us as humans, in some way, is a salesperson. We have to sell our husband to do dinner dishes afterwards, and our wife to take care of the kids at some point. And so we're always selling internally, but with for some reason we get stuck in thinking in our jobs that we are an engineer or we're a carpenter or with one particular thing. And so you have to take a step back and say, you know, okay, if everybody needs one thing, which is they need revenue in order to survive, how can I get creative and help provide that and then ask to share in some of the spoils? You know, are you going to make exactly what you made before right away? Probably not. But are you going to make something? And I think the answer is yes, if we leverage our network and get creative. And like you said, all the tools are out there, you know, at our fingertips, library of Alexandria in the form of Google. Is this, um, I was reading this and I read this to my wife and I've shared it with a few other, uh, other people. Um, it seems like it's more difficult sometimes for, uh, and maybe I'm just generalizing here, but if, for women to kind of step up and ask or do this or make that phone call, is that, am I reading this wrong or is this something that you're seeing as well? I think that's true. I think it's or something. I don't know what the what it would be, but uh, I think it does. I mean, I at least I know what I, I can speak about what I know, which is being a woman and being a Latina, and both of those culturally. Um, you know, you're you're Latino. You know, like what's the first thing your parents tell you? It's like cállate, like Absolutely. you know, don't talk, be quiet. Adults are talking. Don't talk back to me. You know, that's it's a cultural thing of respect and hierarchy and you know not asking for things out of turn and um an environment like that like this that's not helpful you got to go out there and you got to ask and ask for the business and you know what's fascinating is what happens when you do that is it's just a numbers game you reach out to five or six companies and and here's the secret 
if somebody reached out to me right now with a plan for me to grow my business, like an actual thought out plan and said, hey, Cody, I don't have anything going on right now. I got let go. Here's a plan for how to grow X portion of your business. Maybe it's social media. I, I suck at Twitter. Somebody told me that they knew how to figure out Twitter for me and they could help us grow that platform. I'd be like, awesome. Okay, let's try you on a trial basis. How do we determine if it does ROI? If you do well and you grow you know, XYZ, I'll pay you. No problem. And everybody who's a business owner has some segment like that. But the problem is when we look for opportunities, we go really shallow and we go really wide, as opposed to somebody going to you ever and saying, hey, this seems to be a, be a big focus of yours. You seem to be focused on growth here. How, I could do this, I think, to help you grow. These couple ideas would be good. What, what do you say? You don't have to pay me up front. Let me do something for free a little bit. And if I start getting results, could we figure out some way to make this payment happen? Right. As business owners, absolutely bring it on. Most business owners would say, yes, let's at least figure 100%. out what we can do. Um, now, as employees, we need to step up and ask those questions. So I, I love that. Again, uh, easy approach, easy to understand. It's just a matter of getting on, on the phone, reaching out for, via email, whatever you want to do, but asking that. The worst that they're going to say is, no, you're still out of a job or you're still you know, doing what exactly. you were doing. But if it works, that can change lives, really. Especially now. A thousand percent. A thousand percent. And I do think this is an opportunity to work for equity at this point. If people can't pay you and you think you can that. drive results, I would ask for equity. Say, hey, don't worry about paying me. If I achieve X, why don't we figure out an equity component? One thing that I think you should do is try to lock in some of that component at least somewhere early-ish on in your process. Doesn't have to be before you come on, but before you deliver the full product, um, just to protect yourself. But you know, that's always an option. I think you have to be creative with the ways you ask for money. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I had a, a friend who was negotiating a deal and he was like, I want 300K salary. You know, I want 300K salary and that's it. And the guy kind of laughed and he was like, in this environment, I'm sorry, the job's not worth 300K to me because I can get somebody for 100K over here. And I was telling him what you should have done is, first of all, never give the offer up front. Let yeah. the other guy negotiate if you can. Ask him what the job's worth. And then once they tell you, hey, this job is worth 100K for me, then you say, all right, listen, talk to me about how much money you make off of these items. Okay, so the job's worth 100K, that's great. How about if I do these extra things that bring in this extra revenue, I'm not asking for more money up front, I'm just saying if I make you more money, can I make more money? And the business owner is gonna be like, yeah, fine, bring in the money. But if you instead say, I want 300K because I'm going to give you 300K in value, people are going to be like, oh, that's, I don't see a direct correlation. I, I love it. Uh, again, if I was sitting there unemployed or if I just, you know, got let go or I'm, I'm on hold for whatever, you know, because of this pandemic, um, this makes a whole lot of sense. And it's, again, it's easy to do. Um, so again, this is better than most of the books that I've read, most of the speeches that I've, that I've heard over the years, because you break it down and it's, uh, there's action involved. Um, and like you mentioned a little bit earlier, it's a numbers game. Call 10 companies, call 20 companies. Somebody is going to be smart enough. If you give them the right pitch to say, let's give it a shot. And your, yep. your entire, you know, world can change that way. It's so true. Number two, do more that works. Simple. Do more of what works, right? We obviously, they have a business plan. They have something that's already working for them, their, their brand, their service, whatever they're doing. Um, you gave an example. So for a restaurant, um, if you do curbside or delivery, try to 10 exit. Uh, text clients, you have uh, numbers for, email your, li um, your list, some deals, write content to compel, uh, to compel uh, across social um yeah. And let me say one thing about that. I don't like, tell me if this has ever happened to you, even during this crisis, when you go to pick up your to go orders from, you know, the places that are open or you put in their delivery, do they ever ask for your email address or your phone number? Like even in this crisis, they don't. Yeah. And I'm, I'm amazed by that because if I've learned one thing in this crisis, it's that you have to own your end point of contact with your consumers because as most restaurants have seen, they used to be able to have foot traffic. That was fine. They used to be able to have reservations that they could do. But, you know, one of the few people that was always really good at this was, um, you know, Shake Shack and, um, you know, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name, but the guy who created Shake Shack and a slew of other businesses, 
Um, he has a great book on the subject that's escaping me, but he was relentless about having a CRM process, a client relationship management tool for his restaurant clients. It's almost unheard of. And in this environment, I cannot believe, like if you go and work in a restaurant, you should have every time, hey, we're, you, you like hanging out here? You like the food? Can I ask for your you know, phone number and, and email address and name? We're doing some special offers and discounts for frequent customers. And we're realizing that we don't have any of our customers' contact information. I know you want to go local. Would you be willing to share that with us? Easy. Everybody's going to be like, yes, of course I want 20% off. Nobody's doing it. And as a business owner, you own that information, right? It's not a third party, right? It, you, a lot of people connect via Facebook and all these other um, uh, apps. Sometimes, what if they change the algorithm? What if they change their exactly. terms of service? You own this. So it makes a ton of sense to be able to control that by yourself. You know, for us and what we do, we're a media and events company, and um, we still make most of our money through our newsletters, through our email campaigns, right? That's yeah. where we talk, that's where we sell the most tickets where we yeah. sell our services. So email is not dead. Texting is not dead. Oh, no, no, no. Um, so yeah, it makes perfect sense. So anyway, call your former uh, employer and figure out simple things like this that can bring them more revenue. They're going to want to take a chance on you again. Uh, yeah. The last one, think like an owner with everything you do. Um, let's see, where could you call and get better rates on bills outstanding? Where could you barter? Uh, where could you use your network to save the businesses you work for, love, or want to work for? You got to figure them. You got to figure it out. Bring some value to the business owner, to the company, and then they will certainly sit down and talk to you. It's so true. I mean, if I was a bartender or a waitress and out of work right now, you better believe I'd be calling up the restaurant and saying, I know you don't need me, but do you have a CRM and a list that you send information out to? And then they come into the to the uh, restaurant. Oh, you don't? What if I build one for you and I give them a discount code, uh, you know, that's, I don't know, uh, outlier. And on the outlier discount code, if they give that to you, how about I get 5% or 10% of their sales? Um, and But I'm giving you brand new clients that you didn't have before. And the business owner is going to be like, that'd be great. Absolutely. And so yeah, there's a little tiny things that you have to be creative, but instead of all of us drinking more and using more cannabis than ever, maybe uh, think about this. So where, where did that, um, you mentioned earlier, you, you've always had kind of this fight in you, this, this uh, contrarian type of attitude and, and just kind of going out there and getting it. Where did that come from? Mm. Um, Immigrant parents, right? Uh, I'm, a, yeah. I'm assuming you didn't grow up with a ton of contacts and uh, in, in the business world and everything else. You, you kind of had to build it. So how did that happen? Yeah, you know, I my my dad didn't have the opportunity to go to college. He, um, you know, his family were immigrants from Spain during the Civil War. Um, you know, he his parents actually let left him to live with his grandparents for a while because they had to figure out how to make money. And so, you know, my dad and my grandpa would make their own wine and hunt for food. And you know, it was very um, like it would be in rural Spain. And so I certainly learned that from him. I grew up in Arizona and, um, I, you know, I love that state. It's now I realize what I thought was normal is not so normal. You know, we had, we would go and shoot guns on the weekends and go hunting and, um, you know, do kind of these things that perhaps seem a little wild west. And so I think that ingrained itself in me, but I'm very grateful that some of those tough and outdoor situations make you realize, Hey, nobody's dying in business, you know? So you have fun with it. If people say no, it's not that big of a deal because it's not going to kill you. You just have to get used to a little bit of rejection and then it gets so much easier. This uh, We'll end with this. The single biggest reason for your success. Oof. Um, I think it's probably my mantra, which is questioning everything. Never accept the status quo. Question everything uh, because your questions really drive what your answers will be and the answers you'll find. That fits well with our audience. Question everything. We love it. Cody, we're, we're big fans of who you are, what you're doing. Um, obviously, we wish you nothing but success. Um, we're going to have you back in three years, and we'll see where we are with this whole cannabis uh, industry and, and uh, what it's doing. Uh, then. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for having me. I so appreciate it. And um, you're great at asking questions. There's like rapid fire on it. I really I enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for being on. I know we've tried in the past uh, a year or two ago and we had technical difficulties, but I think this was the, the perfect time to do it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Outliers. We'll talk to you tomorrow.